Good afternoon. On today's Angry Bulletin, it appears that NASA has started to embrace some pretty ambitious projects. And perhaps the most ambitious project of all is a project entitled Swarming Proxima Centauri, Coherent Pico Spacecraft Swarms Over Interstellar Distances, a project that not only could deliver a swarm of spacecraft to the nearest star to our own, that is to say, Proxima Centauri, a red dwarf that's part of a trinary star system about four light years away from Earth. In addition to that, it's a project that could also run down a Muamua with considerably less effort and considerably less money than the proposed mission to Proxima Centauri. And it appears that NASA is getting behind both concepts. And what we are going to see in the course of this video is the the latest information from this project, including a real-time depiction of what it's going to look like as this swarm of spacecraft hurtles through the Proxima Centauri system at 60,000 kilometers per second. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to travel at 20% of the speed of light? We're going to find out right now. Good afternoon and welcome to The Angry Astronaut. Some of you may be familiar with this project already when it was called Project Starshot. And I'm going to go ahead and give you a quick overview of how this project intends to get a swarm of probes to Proxima Centauri in a reasonable amount of time at 20% of the speed of light. And I'm just going to quote directly from the proposal by Space Initiatives that has now been funded by NASA. Tiny gram scale interstellar probes pushed by laser light are likely to be the only technology capable of reaching another star this century. Our proposed representative mission around the third quarter of this century is to fly to our nearest neighbor, the potentially habitable world Proxima B, with a large autonomous swarm of thousands of tiny probes. Now, how is this even remotely possible? Well, rather than and try to explain this to you myself with my limited knowledge of physics, I'm instead going to turn this over to perhaps the most qualified person in the world to describe this project. His name was Stephen Hawking, and aggravatingly, in the eight years that has passed since he made this recording on YouTube describing Breakthrough Starshot, only about 20,000 people have actually listened to it. I hope this video changes all of that. So without further ado, let's go ahead and listen to Dr. Hawking's description of Breakthrough Starshot. Last month I joined Yuri Milner to launch Breakthrough Starshot, a long-term research and development program aimed at making interstellar travel a reality. If we succeed, we will send a probe to Alpha Centauri within the lifetime of some of you watching today. Breakthrough Starshot brings together three concepts, miniaturized spacecraft, light propulsion, and face-locked lasers. A Starship, a fully functional space probe reduced to a few centimeters in size and grams in mass, will be attached to a light sail. Made from metamaterials, the light sail weighs no more than a few grams. The Starship and light sail, together known as a nanocraft, will be placed in orbit. Meanwhile, on the ground, an array of lasers at the kilometer scale will combine into a single very powerful light beam. The beam is fired through the atmosphere, striking the sail in space with tens of gigawatts of power. The idea is that the nanocraft rides, like Einstein, on the light beam. Not quite to the speed of light, but to a fifth of it, or 100 million miles an hour. Such a system could reach Mars in an hour, reach Pluto in days, pass Voyager in under a week, and reach Alpha Centauri in just over 20 years. Once there, it could image any planets discovered in the system, test for magnetic fields and organic molecules, 
and send the data back to Earth in another laser beam. This tiny signal would be received by the same array of dishes that was used to transmit the launch beam. This would not be human interstellar travel, even if it could be scaled up to a crewed vessel, it would be unable to stop. But it would be the moment when human culture goes interstellar, when we finally reach out into the galaxy. And if it should send back images of a habitable planet orbiting our closest neighbor, it could be of immense importance to the destiny of our civilization. Now, a great deal has happened with Breakthrough Starshot since this recording was made, so I'm going to go ahead and pick up with their latest presentation that Thomas Eubanks at Space Initiative put forward, and this is on the NASA Advanced Concept site. Quote, given extreme constraints on launch mass, onboard power, and comms aperture, I mean, we're talking just grams, milliwatts, and centimeters versus meters, our team determined in our work over the last three years that only a large swarm of many probes acting in unison can generate an optical signal strong enough to cross the immense distance back to Earth. I think that's important to keep in mind. An optical signal is the best way to transmit information, again indicating that maybe we're looking for the wrong thing when we're looking for radio signals from advanced civilizations as opposed to laser beams. Anyway, we'll continue. The eight-year round trip lag eliminates any practical control by Earth. Therefore, the swarm must possess an extraordinary degree of autonomy. For example, in order to prioritize which data is returned to Earth. Therefore, we can see that coordinating the swarming of individuals into an effective whole is the dominant challenge for our representative mission to Proxima Centauri B. Coordination in turn rests on establishing a mesh network via low power optical links and synchronizing probes on board clock with Earth and with each other in order to support accurate position navigation timing or PNT. Our representative mission begins with a long string of probes launched one at a time to 20% of the speed of light. After launch, the drive laser is used for signaling and clock synchronization, providing a continual time signal like a metronome. Initial boost is modulated so the tail of the string catches up with the head time on target. Exploiting drag imparted by the interstellar medium, velocity on target, over the 20-year cruise keeps the group together once assembled. An initial string of a hundred to thousands of astronomical units, so we're talking a string that starts out many times longer than the diameter of our entire solar system, dynamically coalesces itself over time into a lens-shaped mesh network approximately 100,000 kilometers across, sufficient to account for errors at Proxima, ensuring at least some probes pass close to the target. A swarm whose members are in known spatial positions relative to each other, having state-of-the-art micro-miniaturized clocks to keep synchrony, can utilize its entire population to communicate with Earth, periodically building up a single, short, but extremely bright contemporaneous laser pulse from all of them. Operational coherence means each probe sends the same data but adjusts its emission time according to its relative position such that all pulses arrive simultaneously at the receiving arrays on Earth. This effectively multiplies the power from any one probe by the number n of probes in the swarm, providing orders of magnitude greater data return. A swarm would tolerate significant attrition on route, mitigating the loss of putting all your eggs in one basket and enabling close observation of Proxima B from multiple vantage points. Fortunately, we don't have to wait until mid-century to make practical progress. We anticipate our innovations would have a profound effect on space exploration, complementing existing techniques and enabling entirely new types of missions. For example, Pico spacecraft swarms covering all of cislunar space or instrumenting an entire 
entire planetary magnetosphere well before mid-century, we foresee a number of such missions, such as an Earth or lunar orbit, but in time, extending into the outer solar system. For example, such a swarm could explore the rapidly receding interstellar object one I Amuamua, or the solar gravitational lens. It's very interesting that they bring Amuamua up as one of the primary objectives for an expedition like this. And by the way, what you're watching right now is the proposed Project Lyra mission, which uses more conventional methods and lots of gravitational flybys in order to try to catch up with the Muamua, assuming, of course, that this spacecraft is where we think it is. Keep in mind, a Muamua changed its position approximately 100,000 kilometers in about six months' time compared to where gravity alone should have put the object. And as I've mentioned many times, outgassing doesn't explain this strange diversion of trajectory. Now, if a Muamua is some sort of mundane object, an asteroid, a comet, or anything else, it should not have adjusted its trajectory any more up to this point. It's so far from the sun that outgassing could not possibly adjust its trajectory any further than it already has, which means if we arrive at a Muamua's projected location and there's nothing there that is proof positive that a Muamua is an artificial object and not a natural one. But even if it does adjust its trajectory by a similar degree every year, then we can anticipate that a Muamua will possibly change its position by one to two million kilometers compared to where we think it might be, and a swarm of Pico spacecraft could cover that entire trajectory shift. And keep in mind, you don't need to accelerate these probes to 20% of the speed of light to catch up with the Muamua. Not even close, meaning that the laser arrays necessary to push these probes out to a Muamua as a proof of concept mission would be a lot easier and a lot less expensive than going to the nearest star. And there are other organizations that seem to be very excited about this new technology. For example, the Institute Institute for Interstellar Studies. They had this to say, quote, at the Institute for Interstellar Studies, we are excited about working with space initiatives in demonstrating the concept of operational coherence, which uses the principle of E pluribus unum. This technology should have many applications from low Earth orbit to Mars and beyond, enabling the delivery of equipment and communication arrays across space domains at a fraction of the cost using traditional larger spacecraft while increasing the rate of technological progress, rather like the Cambrian explosion in the history of life on Earth. That's a pretty powerful comparison right there. So it is very encouraging to see NASA actually invest money in all of this. Granted, just because a project receives an Advanced Concepts Award doesn't mean that NASA is definitely going to embrace it, but still, keep in mind how many years this project has been been in process and how many prominent individuals have spoken out in support of it. When you consider the monumental amount of energy and engineering that's required to cross the vast gulf between the stars, this method may be the most practical way of at least getting unmanned craft out to the nearest star. And in spite of what Dr. Hawking had to say about this, it is actually possible to upscale this technology to a crude version, although there are a number of things you need to do in order to make it slow down, but nevertheless, it is possible for this to become a manned expedition sometime in the distant future, traveling as fast as 50% of the speed of light and hauling hundreds of thousands of tons of cargo, but we're never going to get to that point with this type of technology if we don't start out small first. And this proposal 
Google, the latest iteration of Breakthrough Starshot seems like a winner to me. Thank you very much for watching. I am leaving for Cape Canaveral in three days. Looking forward to bringing you some spectacular content. And thank you, Keith Parker and Ian Calvert for donating to this team on PayPal. You guys make a huge difference and I wouldn't be able to go on these trips without your support. So once again, thanks so much. And if you like to join these two gentlemen, all the details are in the description. Thanks again for watching and as always, stay angry about space.